Two things I wanna get just out of the way right at the top. One, it is time to expose critical role and more specifically, Marisha Ray for who she really is, which is why I had a two hour thoughtful conversation with her over at youtube.com slash ACW. Definitely check that podcast out after today's show. And two, this is your official, official warning that next Monday, the 26th, I have an exclusive drop at shopdefranco.com. It's our biggest drop yet. More designs, more colors, more product types, including the much requested fleece shorts, as well as the cropped hoodie. But yeah, welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. It is Wednesday, April 21st, 2021. Like the video, definitely subscribe. A new subscriber for the month of April will be getting $5,000. And let's just jump into it. Now, first up today, we have a story that has blown up this week. Some of you requested it. And uh, to be honest, I do think it is genuinely one of the dumbest stories to get attention this week. So let's get through this Demi Lovato news. If you didn't see, she was feuding with a uh, Froyo shop. This is because Demi wrote about her experience going to a shop in LA called The Big Chill, saying, finding it extremely hard to order Froyo from The Big Chill when you have to walk past tons of sugar-free cookies slash other diet foods before you get to the counter. Do better, please, hashtag diet culture vultures. And adding that she plans to use the hashtag to call out brands that use harmful diet messaging that can perpetuate and support eating disorders. Now, as far as the big chill, uh, reportedly they DM'd her saying that they were sorry if she found anything offensive. Also responding publicly, sharing that they carry items for people with dietary needs and restrictions like diabetes, celiac disease, vegans, and more. Right? And all of that in addition to their more indulgent items. But Demi responded to this by saying that it should be clearer in the labels that those products are there to accommodate certain restrictions. And you know, following this, you had some people saying, thank you, Demi, for speaking up for us. Others saying, you're being ridiculous. Right, essentially saying you're attacking this small Froyo shop for having sugar-free options. Right, you had big names chiming in with uh, The Big Chill actually reposting a story from Mia Khalifa where she said to support local businesses that accommodate dietary restrictions and allergies. Though we also saw the likes of Jamila Jamil supporting Demi, writing, but if an eating disorder advocate says she sees products that are positioned as guilt-free and it is potentially triggering, that doesn't mean she's too stupid to remember that diabetics exist. It just means that we need to change the marketing of products that are for people's medical needs. Guilt-free is diet culture terminology. We need to stop using that fucking term. Demi also ended up apologizing to the shop in an eight minute Instagram video saying her message should have come across clearer. Also trying to explain that seeing stuff like that is difficult for her, that she's sensitive about this. My intentions were not to come in and bully a small business. That was not it. I walked in, was so triggered that I left without Froyo and made me really sad. Also, I've seen a bit of fake news with this story going around, right? There were, there were rumors and reports that Demi actually donated to The Big Chill, that now they're changing their menu. Uh, the Big Chill actually addressed that this morning, saying they haven't changed their menu, nor have they received a donation. Also saying they haven't heard from her since her sorry, not sorry apology on Monday. Though, I'm sure they didn't mind the attention. Uh, according to the LA Times, the shop went from 6,000 followers before Demi's post to now over 32,000. I've also had friends in the area saying there are lines out the door to get into this place now. And as far as my reaction to this, and also, I, I just want to preface it. This is a reaction from someone that's actually struggled with an eating disorder. I feel like in general, diet culture, yes, can be incredibly toxic. It should be all about long-term health, long-term goals. And that way, it's part of the reason why I'm glad Demi Lovato is no longer pushing detox teas. But here, to me, this feels like it got completely overblown and ended up just being bullying and attacking a small business. Right? Not the ideal or best thing to do with a small business in an industry that's just been ravaged over the past year. There was a better way to do this and it feels weird that someone that is essentially arguing that words matter didn't think about her words when, when bringing up this issue that she had. But yeah, that is kind of where I'm going to end this. I, on the notion of the, the words matter, and I feel like if I go any longer, I'm just going to kind of unnecessarily punch down on her because based off of the documentary and just her post in general, it feels like she's going through a lot. And whether it be me or Demi Lovato in this situation, I, I think we could all benefit from the... Uh, Words do matter, so let's try and have a conversation, educate, rather than maybe tear down. Asterisk, because I'm an asshole, uh, when possible. Then we should talk about the massive news and update around Europe's Super League. Of course, we talked about this story back on Monday. And in general, at that time, the reaction seemed to be, oh, this Philip DeFranco bloke, he understands that it's all balls up. It's complete tosh from these minted cunts. Also, uh, I would like to officially apologize to whatever <laughs> that accent was. I don't, I don't know. Bellof, please don't. But main thing, just two days after all of this was announced, it is now suspended. With that decision first announced last night, following an emergency meeting of the league's board with one ESPN writer writing, that the announcement went live, suspended by a thread over a giant pit 
of derision, incompetence, and failure. Right, and that kind of backlash was widespread. It also undoubtedly influenced why we began seeing teams that had signed up to be founding members of a league backing out last night. Right, for example, first, you had England's Manchester City releasing a single sentence statement reading, Manchester City Football Club can confirm that it has formally enacted the procedures to withdraw from the group developing plans for a European Super League. Following that, we saw all five of the other English teams that had signed up as founding members backing out as well, with Manchester United specifically citing fan, government, and stakeholder reactions as its reason for pulling out. Meanwhile, Arsenal apologized for, quote, making a mistake. And so this kind of just kept continuing until there were only two founding teams left, one of which was Real Madrid, whose president was actually the Super League chair. And from there, we saw the league suspension announcement. However, in that same statement, it also said that it was still, quote, convinced that the current status quo of European football needs to change. And adding that the league's English founding teams were forced to drop out due to the pressure put on them and saying that it will reconsider the most appropriate steps to reshape the project. Right, so seemingly that statement saying, yeah, we're dead, but only for now. Which in no way is surprising. I mean, the pursuit of money will give you a lot of drive. And in general, that's what this was seen as, a pursuit of money. The owners of these clubs wanting more money, and the only reason they got stopped is because the public in general beat the hell out of them with a bat. Right, essentially threatening to not watch this league to make it economically unviable. And let's be honest, they are going to try it again. All these statements of, we're sorry, we're listening to the fans. Yeah, you're listening to the fans and they said, go fuck yourself, we're not gonna give you any more money. Don't act like you care now, the mask is off. And from that, let's take a second to pay some bills and thank the fantastic sponsor of today's show, Squarespace. You know, over the past year, I know many of you have found your passion projects and what truly makes you happy, whether that means finally getting your independent business off the ground or creating a place to share your homemade goods, a new favorite hobby, obsession, or maybe even a personal blog to get all those thoughts out of your head and Squarespace is there to help. And it's so easy. There's nothing to install, patch, or upgrade ever. And creating a beautiful website with Squarespace's all-in-one platform has never been so simple. It's extremely intuitive and easy to use. Plus, with Squarespace, you get access to all their marketing tools and analytics and personalized support from their award-winning customer care team via email or live chat. Whatever you need, they are available 24-7 to help out. So if you want to check it out, see if it's right for you, see why so many others love it, start your free trial today over at squarespace.com slash fill. And when, not if, you realize you love it, make sure you enter an offer code fill to get 10% off your first purchase. Then, in COVID-19 news, while we are seeing some hopeful numbers in the United States, 26% of adults fully vaccinated, around 40% at least have had the first shot. The number of average cases over the last 14 days is relatively flat. The number of daily deaths on the decline also under 800. But it is also important to note that is not the case everywhere. Some of the most notable numbers coming out of India. They are having a major flare up of the virus though. The country is currently facing nearly 2,000 daily deaths, 300,000 daily cases. And while yes, it is important to note that India has a massive population. And it is true that its current infection rate as a percentage of population is better than the U.S. was at its worst. It still does not take away from the numbers that in the last 17 days, COVID positivity rates doubled to 17%. And in high population areas like Delhi, it's at 30%. And so hospitals across the country are filled to capacity. Possibly most concerning is that young people are taking up most of the beds. For example, across the nation, 60% of the hospitalization cases are from those under the age of 45. And right now, the sudden spike in cases is officially being blamed on a more virulent strain that has emerged in the country, but many have also placed blame with the Modi government, which has been accused of lax policies to fight the pandemic. In fact, cases are rising so fast that the head of Apollo Hospitals, a large chain of hospitals in the country, they estimate that with these new infections, India will have nearly reached herd immunity by September, and that coming from both extreme infection rates right now, as well as ongoing vaccination efforts. Although, making the problem worse, the country is currently facing a severe vaccine shortage. And then, let's talk about a story that has just blown up, the, the news that Columbus police shot and killed a black teenager yesterday right before the Derek Chauvin verdict was read. The girl who was shot and killed was identified as 16-year-old Micaiah Bryant by a spokesperson for Franklin County Children's Services. And when this news came out, there were a lot of different stories and narratives. You had Micaiah's aunt, Hazel Bryant, telling the Daily Beast that adult women had come to the foster home Micaiah lived at and started an altercation with her niece. Her niece then calling the police. Hazel then claiming that Micaiah grabbed a knife to defend herself and was fending off a physical assault when police arrived, but with her also telling a local outlet that Micaiah had dropped the knife before she was shot. But then you also had police tell testimony, and most importantly, body cam footage. Right, so during a news conference late last night, you had police saying that the shooting happened after they received a 911 call just after 4.30, saying they got that call from someone who said that women were trying to stab them before hanging up, with the law enforcement officials also playing segments of the body cam footage from the officer who fired the shot, saying that the footage showed the victim lunging at two others with a knife. And in the graphic video, which I, I can't show here because YouTube will likely kill the video, you see the officer getting out of the car as Micaiah appears to chase someone who falls down to the sidewalk. You also have someone there that appears to be kicking at the person that's down. Micaiah then 
lunges at another person who appears to be holding a dog. The officer yells, get down several times before quickly firing at least four shots. Very notably in the slow motion capture of the video shown by police, it appears to show that the knife is in her hand at that time. She then collapses on the ground and in the body cam footage, you see the knife next to her as officers attempt CPR, which is why you had a good number of people saying that Hazel Bryant must have just seen things wrong or misremembered or she's just outright lying. But, you know, following this, according to local reports, shortly after the shooting, a group of roughly 60 people gathered at the site to demonstrate, but ended up being dispersed around 10 p.m. Other protesters taking to the streets of downtown with many gathering in front of the Columbus Police Department headquarters. The whole situation began trending on Twitter. You had people like Derek Johnson, the president of the NAACP, tweeting, the emotional contrast between the Derek Chauvin verdict and the killing of Micaiah Bryant is exactly why we must not use small wins to justify the end of large fights. You also had Ben Crump, the lawyer of George Floyd's family writing, as we breathed a collective sigh of relief today, a community in Columbus felt the sting of another police shooting as Columbus police killed an unarmed 15 year old black girl named Micaiah Bryant. Others also condemning the officer, describing what he did as immediately shooting Micaiah instead of trying to de-escalate the situation. With people saying things like, I would really like to know why a trained police officer assumed that the only way to de-escalate a fight where a 16 year old black girl had a knife was to immediately shoot her dead. But on the other side of this, you have a lot of people saying, no, the officer did the right thing here. Despite what her aunt said happened, despite how Ben Crump described the situation, we have video footage, slow motion footage, that shows Micaiah with a police officer present lunging at someone with a knife in hand. Or with comments like, the officer isn't a murderer, he did his job and shot someone who went out with a knife and tried to stab another black person. Though that still wasn't enough for some people, some saying he should have used a taser. With people writing things like, I don't care what she was swinging at other people. If you can take a white man with an AK-47 or an AR-15 into custody alive, you cannot shoot a 15 year old girl with a knife five times. And of course, this is still a developing situation. Details are still coming out. I mean. Just as the show was about to go up, Columbus police identified the officer who shot Micaiah as Nicholas Reardon, who reportedly has only been with the department since December of 2019. But that's the story as it is right now. I'll also link to the body cam footage. I just, I can't include it in today's show. But with what we are seeing about the situation right now, I would love to know your thoughts here. Right, are you in the camp of the officer did nothing wrong here? He did the best he could with what was happening in front of him. He saw someone being attacked. Or no, are you in the camp of the police officer is wrong here? As some have suggested, he should have used a taser instead of immediately going to his firearm. He should have done something else? If so, what do you think that would have been? But yeah, I would definitely love to know your thoughts here, especially because if you look online right now, there are a bunch of different narratives, some based off of different times where we did have this sort of information, we didn't have this other information. But also keep in mind, this is still a developing story. And then finally today, we should talk about Attorney General Merrick Garland, who announced this morning that the Justice Department is launching a sweeping civil rights investigation into the Minneapolis Police Department. And in his statement, Garland said that the inquiry will decide if the MPD engages in a pattern or practice of unconstitutional or unlawful policing and adding, yesterday's verdict in the state criminal trial does not address potentially systemic policing issues in Minneapolis. Public safety requires public trust. Among other things, the probe will look at whether the officers used excessive force, engaged in discriminatory conduct, and treated people with behavioral health disabilities in an unlawful manner. Garland also saying that the investigators will review MPD policies, training, supervision, accountability systems, as well as the tactics used against protesters during the protests last summer. This including tear gas and other less than lethal munitions. Right, and this latest move represents a massive reversal for the Trump administration, which basically abandoned these kinds of probes under former attorneys General Sessions and Barr, who both largely opposed federal efforts to root out systemic issues in local law enforcement agencies. With Sessions even enacting a policy back in 2018 that basically banned the DOJ from pursuing what's known as consent decrees, which are settlements that establish reform measures for police departments that are found to have violated civil rights protection. But actually regarding that, last Friday, Garland reversed that decision, making it one of the Biden administration's first major moves to hold police forces accountable in civil rights cases. And as far as what happens next, Garland has said that the probe is already underway. Also adding that if the investigators find that the department has engaged in any unlawful practices, they will one, issue a public report, and two, the Federal Civil Rights Division will try to work with the Minneapolis police to find ways to fix the issue. But uh, regarding this investigation, it could take a while. Reportedly, it could take months or even years. And ultimately with this story, and honestly, anything else that stood out to you today, I'd love to know your thoughts in those comments down below because this is the end of today's show. As always, thank you for watching, liking, hitting that subscribe button, all the good stuff. Also, if you're looking for more to watch today, I got that brand new podcast with Marisha Ray, or maybe some more news, I got you right there, or top links down below. But with that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces, and I'll see you tomorrow.